This is not the message I had prepared for this Sunday, but as I sat down to write, I had finished it in rough, the message I was going to speak, and as I sat down to just write it out, as I do every week, the Lord kept putting a scripture in my heart. It just simply wouldn't go away. So I turned to it, and I felt the Lord wanting me to stand here this morning to encourage many who have decided to attend this service today. Psalm 3, I want to speak to you on the secret war of every saint. The secret war of every saint. There's no ex exceptions to this rule. It's more intense at some times than others. You're going to be a Christian in New York City, you're going to fight a terrible mental battle to walk with God. There's, some, there's a spirit in the city like none other you'll ever face in your lifetime. I remember Pastor David once told me he would hear demonic voices cursing him on the platform. I remember walking with him down the street and there were two people sleeping on the side of a building and one of them watching him walk by, not even knowing who he is, shouted out, we're going to get you, we're not finished yet. It's a demonic spirit in that man that saw him pass by. I used to feel upset that no demonic spirit ever spoke to me like that. <laughs> and one day I was walking to church here in the morning several years ago and the guy who was obviously full of the devil started following me, cursing me all the way down the street, not really knowing probably, or maybe did. But anyways, I was just so glad and made my heart glad. <laughs> so that finally the devil knows who I am. Thank God. If you're going to walk with God in this city, you're going to fight. You're going to fight in your mind. It's the deepest battle you will ever fight. I remember one time leaving this sanctuary and we had just come through uh, a terrible battle in this congregation that I really don't want to discuss this morning, but we'd just come through it. And uh, the Lord had blessed, the altars had opened, it was amazing. People were, dozens and dozens of people were coming to Christ, unprecedented numbers in the history of the church. And I remember going down 8th, heading to the parking garage, and as I stood on the corner, a voice said to me, you're finished here. Your time is wrapped up, you've done, you've done what you're called to do, you'll be leaving shortly. Um, and honestly, I'm not even thinking these things. It's just out of, right out of nowhere. Just confronted by this. It's a mental battle. I, I remember telling one of the pastors one time, you're going to fight in your mind in this church like you've never fought in your lifetime. And he, he told me, he said he looked at me and, and he just shrugged his shoulders in agreement, but he didn't really agree in his heart. He said, can't be any worse than anywhere else I've been. Six months later, he came and said, I've never fought in my mind like I fight in this city. And it never ends. It's not just a church-related thing. It's being a Christian in this environment of, of whatever it means to be a Christian in Manhattan and New York City. I often wonder, is it possible that God has determined to do something in this city? That, because whatever happens in New York City does affect the rest of the world. It is possible. I want to speak to you about the secret war of every saint. Father, I thank you, Lord God, for the anointing of your Holy Spirit. I thank you for your strength and your power. I thank you, God Almighty, for igniting this word in our hearts and using it to destroy every weapon of darkness that is formed against us. We curse in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ every tongue that rises against us in judgment. We have the right to condemn it. This is the scripture says, this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. We have a righteousness given to us of God. We stand right, we stand clean, we stand accepted. And God, you have a plan for each of our lives that will not be short-circuited by the powers of darkness. It cannot be unless we choose to forfeit it. Now, Father, I thank you for this. I pray God with all my heart, Lord, let this word find its mark in every heart. Give us grace and victory this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 3, a psalm of David, King David of Israel, when he was fleeing from his son Absalom, who rose up against him in rebellion. Lord, how many, or how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. 
Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. That's an incredible statement. But thou, O Lord, art a shield from me, my glory and the lifter of mine head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. I laid me down and slept. I waked, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs unto the Lord, and thy blessing is upon thy people. Selah. Now, when David wrote this, he's struggling with a sense of past failure and present weakness. And that can be the portion of many of God's people. We look back and we feel like we've, there are things in all of our lives that we would like to have done better. Mistakes that we made. David had made a terrible mistake at this case, this point in his life. He doesn't fully realize perhaps he's still on the victory side. God is still proud of him. The lineage of Christ is still going to physically flow through him. Plus the spiritual promise of the blessing of God through Abraham still is being furthered through his, pres his body. But he has a past failure and he has some present weakness. Deep sense of perhaps that I'm, I'm far from where I should be. I'm not what I'm called to be. I thought my life was going to, and my character was going to change more rapidly than it did. I, didn't, I never thought I would respond the way I've been responding to people maybe in the workplace, in your home, your family. I, I came home with such promise, but I seem to have made so many mistakes. Paul wrote about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 5. He talked about being in Macedonia, a specific part of his journey. And he said, our flesh had no rest. We were troubled on every side. Outside of us or without were fightings and within were fears. In other words, there, there are voices that have been raised against the apostle Paul and his company on the outside. Mocking voices, cursing voices, all types of things that are coming against him. And it's producing inside of him an inner fear where there's now a new whole level of voices that Paul had to contend with. It's the voice of his own heart. It's, it's that which found a seed inside of him, that which is threatening his life in Christ at this particular moment by taking away his faith and courage and putting fear again inside of his heart. Because of the depth of the struggle, David's heart became open to these condemning voices, both from outside and now from inside, coming out of the fears of his own heart. Many, he said, are troubling me. Many are risen against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no help for him in God. You remember as he's leaving Jerusalem, even this uh, unsavory character called Shimei is up on the hillside casting stones and cursing his name. David said, leave him alone. Maybe God will hear his cursing and choose to have mercy on me. Another psalmist in Psalm 77 describes it this way. He talks about his own infirmity. At the end of these verses, he said, then I realized this was coming out of the frailty of my own human heart. And we must be careful, you and I, because we can get in situations where our own heart begins to take over for the, the voice of God. We create inner voices that really don't belong to God. They're not part of scripture. They're not true. But this psalmist was in a moment of despair as somebody is here this morning. And here's what he said. Will the Lord cast off forever? Number one, number one mistake, he wasn't cast off, but he felt like he was cast off. And will he be favorable no more? Second mistake. He thought he had lost the favor of God on his life, but in reality, the favor of God was just as strong as it had been when he was living on the mountaintop. He just wasn't aware of it. We need to be careful what we start thinking when we find ourselves in a valley. Verse 8, he says, is his mercy clean gone forever? Has he forgotten to be mercy? Does his promise fail forevermore? Can I trust the promises of God? What happened to the promise of God that I would have a new heart, a new mind, and a new spirit? That my house would be saved if I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and trust him? What happened to the promise of God that 
The woundings of the past wouldn't continue to burden me down any longer. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't live with that continual sorrow and heaviness in my heart. Has God forgotten to be gracious? He says in verse nine, is, is he busy? Has he forgotten to be kind to me? Or has he in anger shut up his tender mercies? The psalmist is saying, did I do something wrong? Did I offend God? Have I crossed a line? Did God finally look down on me and said, I've, I've just wasted so much time with this person. I'm not going to waste any more time trying to infuse life and gifts and talents and such like when they're refused to be used. Has he shut up his mercy because he's found some flaw in me that, that I'm aware of, but he is more aware of even that I am. This is the secret war of every saint. Moments when we get weary with the journey. We get tired of seemingly always walking uphill. We get worn down by the voices that are constantly condemning our progress. We sometimes wish that we could just stay asleep and make it all go away. Has that ever happened to you? You ever just wish that you could stay sleeping because there's peace there? And you, you hate the moment when you wake up because you've got to face it all all over again. You go to bed at night and say, oh, would, would be to God I could die in my sleep and wake up in heaven. It'd be awesome. It's difficult to live in relationships or in a home, a household where you are demeaned. It's hard to be maybe the only believer in your house or one of two in a marriage and your partner's not saved and they mock you're going to church and they're so quick to point out your every flaw. You're believing God for change, but you have another voice when you get home that says, oh, look at this, I thought you were a Christian. Look at that, I thought you were a Christian. Look at that, I thought your character had changed. They, they push all your buttons all day, and when you finally respond to something, then ha ha, out comes the threatening finger. <laughs> or you're in a school system that declares you as irrelevant. You're not a functioning, productive member of society because you hold to these narrow, bigoted views of Judeo-Christian ethic. And so we don't want to hear from you. We don't want to hear your argument. Ah, oh, it's outdated. It's passe. We're now a post-Christian society. So get over that and come along with us on the journey of enlightenment and wonderment and freedom and all the rest of it. It's hard to be, get up every day for college students and go into a classroom, or high school students, and go into a classroom where what you believe is mocked as narrow, bigoted, uninformed, and uneducated. Or on a job where your integrity and worth, work ethic are hated. You make the choice to be a good employee. You make the choice to, to write honestly in the books. You make the choice to tell the truth about why certain appointments can't be fulfilled and such like and you're hated for it by not only your co-workers, but even some of those that are over you. Or to be in a place that declares your dreams unreachable. You can find yourself in a neighborhood, a culture, a society, where all around you, you have an inner dream. It's put there by God. God spoke something into your heart, and, and maybe like Joseph, you've gone out and told somebody, but you're in an environment that is completely hostile to it. You're told to wake up, get real. Nobody gets out of this place. You'll never be what you think in your heart has been given to you. It's hard to live in a society that calls the good that you embrace evil. And the evil that you hate, they call it good. Every day walking through the streets. The psalmist said there are many, many voices which say there is no help for him in God. In other words, nothing will make a difference. The downward spiral is irreversible. Give up the fight. That's exactly what the devil is after. Give up. Give up believing for your home. Give up believing that you can make a difference. Give up the dream that God has planted in your heart. Give up on your marriage and just simply walk out. Your partner's never gonna get saved. Give up on the society around you and just shut yourself away and sleep away the rest of your life. Be satisfied with just being called a disciple of Jesus Christ, but don't ever believe that your life can make a difference. There are so many voices now saying these things. I think about Lazarus and in my mind's eye, 
after he was raised from the dead, John chapter 12 says he was sitting at the table with Jesus, raised from the dead. And not only did people come to see Jesus, but the Bible says they also came to see Lazarus who was raised from the dead. And even the Pharisees were hanging around outside the window plotting how to put this man to death. Because of him, people were believing in Jesus. Imagine that, the poor fellow, he gets raised from the dead and now people want to kill him. <laughs> and I can see him, it's only my imagination, but I can see Lazarus at the table and, and people coming and saying, how did it happen? How did you get this divine life infused within you? How did you get taken out of a hopeless place? And I could hear him saying to the people, I, I could increasingly hear voices. I was, I was so sick, I was so down, things were looking so bad. Jesus had come before and he was part of our family. I was sure he was going to come and help me. But around me, as light began to fade in my soul, I began to increasingly hear voices talking about the hopelessness of the situation and how moment by moment it was getting worse. You ever heard a voice like that? The hopelessness of believing your children are going to come to God and how moment by moment, even though you pray, Jesus doesn't seem to be showing up and the situation seems to be getting worse all the time. You pray for the people on your job and moment by moment it's getting worse to the natural eye. Lazarus would say, I heard voices around me when I was laying down in my place of despair, declaring that for some unknown reason, Jesus hadn't come. And then finally I heard voices saying that the end had come. Many there be which save my soul, there is no help for him in God. That's the ultimate goal of the devil is to get you to agree with that statement, to get you to the place of saying, not even God can help me now. And I don't know why, but even if I believe he could, he's not going to. He's, he's found some flaw in me. His promises to me no longer apply. I've come out of favor and he's angry with me and he's shut up his tender mercy from me. And so finally, this voice comes and says, the end has come. And Lazarus would tell them, and also my own voice, in a final inner cry for mercy before I fell asleep. Verses four and five, he said, I cried unto the Lord with my voice. In verse five, it says, I laid me down and slept. And some of you, that's exactly where you are right now. You went, you cried when you went to sleep last night. You don't know how you're gonna get out of your situation. You don't see any light at the end of the tunnel. And before you fell asleep, you cried one last, and it's almost like a whisper in the dust, a pitiful cry it says, oh God, please help me. I don't know how I'm going to go on. I don't know how I'm going to get through this. And that's what David said, I cried to the Lord with my voice and I laid me down and slept. Just like Elijah, after depression settled in on his life, he'd won marvelous victories, but he succumbed to a voice that said, I'm gonna take your head off before this day is over. And it sent him to a place of seclusion and depression, a place where all he could produce is a whisper for God and a wish that he could lay down, go to sleep and never wake up again. And Lazarus would have told them, that's all I had left. All I had left was a whisper. Jesus, don't forget me. Jesus, help me. And maybe that's the only prayer you feel today that you've got left. But then the testimony doesn't stop there. As people gather in that room and they gather around the table, Lazarus would say to them, but then there was one more voice and it was a voice like no other I had ever heard in my life. I had heard this voice before, but never with this kind of power. 
It was a voice that had the power to call me out of hopelessness. It was a voice that had the power to hold me in the palm of its hand. It was the voice that had the power to give life where there is no life and give hope where there is no hope. It was a voice that drowned out. It was spoken so loud that it drowned out the voices of all the wailers, all the weepers, all the prognosticators, all the ones gathered around where I was saying, too bad, so sad, not even God could do anything now. Too bad he didn't come. Too bad it's too late. Suddenly I heard a voice and it was so loud it drowned out every other voice everything that was being spoken around me. And it simply called my name. That's all this voice did, it called my name. And called me to come out of where I was into another place that he had predestined for my life to live in him. But thou Lord David said art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter of my head. The sound of this voice Put glory, it, the word means substance. It means something of God that wasn't there, or if it was, I didn't know it was there. Something of God within me came to life. This voice was the glory and the lift of my head. So Lazarus could tell the people, I suddenly lifted up my head and wanted to get up again. I had slept long enough. I heard a voice calling me. I heard a voice saying, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I heard a voice saying, a nursing mother can forget her child, but yet I cannot forget you. I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. I heard a voice saying to me, I give you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. I heard a voice saying, come to me if you're laboring and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Come learn of me. I'm meek and lowly of heart and you shall find rest for your soul. I heard a voice saying, if anyone is still thirsty, let him come unto me and drink. He that believes on me as the scripture has said, out of his inward parts shall flow rivers of living water. I heard a voice saying, I've come to give you life and I've come to give it to you more abundantly. I heard a voice saying no weapon formed against you can prosper and every tongue that rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness is of me, says the Lord. I heard a voice louder than any voice I'd ever heard before. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. I heard a voice that has the power to create I heard a voice that can say, let there be light, and there was light. I heard a voice that can divide the waters from above from the waters beneath. I heard a voice that can establish continents and oceans. I heard a voice that has the power to create life where no life exists. I heard a voice that breathed into a pile of dust in the face of the earth and said, live, and Adam became a living soul. I heard a voice like no other voice. Verse five says, I laid me down and slept. I awakened and the Lord sustained me. And what it means, the original text, it says, it means abruptly awakened. This voice called me suddenly. This voice called me quickly. And when it says sustain, it means grip me, laid hold of me. I wasn't expecting it. I, was, I came to church like I always do every Sunday morning. But this morning I was in despair like I've never been all of my life. But suddenly I heard the voice of God and I heard God speak to me in a way that it awakened me. It literally gripped me and laid hold of me and lifted me and gave me courage again to get up. And not only get up, but I was gonna go farther than I've ever gone before. I was gonna go through an open door. I only had a little strength, but I heard this voice telling me, you only have a little strength, but I've set you bef before you an open door and no man, no one can close that door that I've set before you. That's why David said, I will not be afraid of 10,000s of people that have set themselves against me round about. In other words, 10,000 people can't close that door that God has opened before me. 
God destined my life to be victorious. God destined your life to be victorious. He called you to be a song of praise to his name on the earth. He called you to be more than a conqueror. He called you to be victorious. He called you to stand when no one else can stand. He called you to give voice to what God alone is able to do in those who are surrendered to him. And he has opened a door before you in the littleness of your strength and 10,000 people can't close that door. Lazarus would say, I knew this voice had in it all authority, all power, all compassion, and could raise even that which had died in me back to life again. This voice was the author of my life. This voice was my eternity and everything in between. He was my glory and the lifter of my head. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. That's why David said, I will not be afraid of 10,000s of people that have set themselves against me round about. Arise, O Lord, and save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. You've broken the teeth of the ungodly. One time, years ago in ministry, I had a, an ungodly man rise up his voice against me. It pretended to be my friend for a season. But then, when the opportunity presented itself, out of nowhere, he rose up saying all kinds of horrific things against me. It was truly amazing. And it was very hard to bear it. But then one day I met him on the street. And overnight, his, he put his teeth in a glass and his dog got a hold of his teeth and chewed his teeth. <laughs> I met him on the street and he couldn't, I couldn't make out a word he said. <laughs> you see, That's why David said, you've smitten my enemies on the cheekbone and you've broken the teeth of the ungodly. It's hard to take somebody serious that has no teeth and they can't smile anymore with their condescending smile. It's all gone. They just look like a gummy bear trying to curse you. I remember walking away and as I walked away, I didn't understand a word he said. It was about, blah, 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 it's all I could hear. And when I walked away, that scripture came to my mind. He has broken the teeth of the ungodly. <laughs> Salvation belongs to the Lord and thy blessing is upon thy people. That's why Paul the apostle says it this way, as it is written, for thy sake we're killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. But in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. More than conquerors. Though an ungodly world stand against us, though every demonic voice of hell oppose us, though the condescending sneers of this generation look down upon us as if somehow we've just crawled out from under a rock and have nothing worthy to say. No, sir, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We live on the winning side. We stand on a foundation of truth. We are more than conquerors in Christ. And Paul said, I'm persuaded, neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I will not be afraid of 10,000s of people that have set themselves against me round about. You are my glory, Jesus Christ, and you are the lifter of my head. Thank God. The scripture says in Hebrews today, if you can hear his voice, don't harden your heart as they did in the days of provocation. Don't say, as Israel once said, can God furnish a table in this wilderness? Don't question my integrity, the Lord says. Don't question my commitment to you. Don't question my power. Don't question the cross and what it was all about. I said I will not leave you nor forsake you. I will not fail you. I told you that I would raise you up and be a testimony. I have spoken to you and told you that all things that I've allowed into your life some things you understand and some things you don't, but all things do work together for good because you are lovers of God 
and you're called according to the purpose of God. Everything I've allowed into your life has a reason. And now I'm calling you to get up. Now I'm calling you to lift up your head. I'm calling you. Your salvation is closer now than you ever believed it would be. I'm calling you to sing that song that I promised to put within your heart. I'm calling you to come back to faith again and truly believe that what you have put into the hand of God, he's able to keep against that day. He said, I've placed you in my father's hand and nobody can take you out of the hand of my father. You are not going down, you're going up. You're not going under, you're going over. You are an overcomer. You are the bride of Jesus Christ. He stakes his life and his reputation on keeping you and establishing a testimony of victory inside of your life. Don't give up on your children. Sometimes the darkest part comes just before the morning. Don't give up on your family. Don't give up on people in your workplace. They're testing you, they're pushing you, they're prodding you. Many people just wanna know if what you believe is real. They don't expect perfection, they just expect reality. That's all they're looking for in this generation. This is a visual generation. Nobody reads the Bible, they're not gonna read. You can give free Bibles out to all your workplace and nobody is gonna read them. They might use it as a coaster for their coffee, but they won't open it, they won't read it. You are the only Bible now that people are going to read. So settle it in your heart. He is my glory. He is the lifter of my head. Even though I might be depressed at night when I go to bed, he's the one who will lift my head in the morning. He's the one who will give me the strength to go through another day. He'll give me the vision that he has set before my heart. He'll take me out of wherever I am. And if he's planted a dream inside of my heart, it will become a reality because he has set before me a door that no man can close. I don't care how many voices rise against what God has spoken in my heart. Hallelujah. Glory to the name of Jesus. Glory to the name of Jesus. I read the end of the book and we win this war. We win it. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Don't be weary in well-doing. There's great reward ahead of you. For everyone who stood for God, everyone who's gone through all of the valleys, the trials, the difficulties that all of us have to face, there's a day coming. You saw today the church saw fit to acknowledge and, and say thank you for 20 years in this church, but that's nothing compared to what awaits you one day in heaven. When all heaven stands because you stood and you believed God, you believed by faith that he was able to do everything he said he was going to do. You refused the voices of liars. David did come back into Jerusalem and David did finish his course. God did give David the pattern of a New Testament temple and David did pass it on to his son Solomon and the glory of God did come into that temple. I tell you folks, it's not over. There's not a simple, single voice in this world that can tell you it's over. <laughs> Only one voice has the keys. Only one voice has the power. Only one voice is truth. Only one voice has the promises that never fail. Only one voice that will still be there when other, all other voices have lost heart and hope. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord, who will never fail you, he will never forsake you. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't walk away. Don't lose heart. Don't listen to these voices. Don't give in to the spirit of this culture and this city. Stand in the truth that you know. Stand in the grace of the God who has given you his son and his Holy Spirit within you. Stand on the promises that God has made to your heart and to your life. Stand and it doesn't matter who agrees with you. As long as God does, that's all that matters. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I thank you, God, with all my heart that you've given me the ability to convey this word. Jesus, Son of God, I ask you to destroy the weapons of the devil. Destroy the lies of darkness. 
Encourage us in the frailty of our own hearts. And let there be a victory, O oh God, in our lives in this generation that defies explanation apart from the promises of God. Thank you for this, Lord. Take us in our weakness, O oh God. Take us, Lord Jesus Christ, in our confusion. Take us, God, in our struggles. And we open our hearts and invite you to build a testimony of your glory inside of us as you did for Lazarus. You let him die so that you could raise him from the dead. You yourself said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God. I thank you, Lord, that all of our struggles and trials and difficulties have a divine purpose. There's nothing in our lives that you didn't allow there for a reason. Give us the courage to get up. Father, we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. For, for those who need encouragement today, you've really been battling. And you say, Pastor, I thank God the Holy Spirit put this message on your heart because it's my life. It's the prayer I prayed last night. It's the whisper in the dust that's become my prayer life. But I hear God calling me. God knew you were going to be here today. That's why he interrupted what he had, I had originally intended to speak. He knew you would be here. He led you here. And all that remains now is on your part is just simply get up and move towards the hope that God is speaking to you. The life and the victory. The strength that you're going to need to get through this next week. Courage you need to stand in your marketplace, in your society, wherever it is that you find yourself. The faith to believe for your family. The strength to endure the scorn that you face every day. God will give it to you. Don't think that because you have a victory that there aren't people outside the window that want to kill you. But you will stand. And so as we stand up in the balcony, the annex, you could step between the screens, the same in North Jersey, please. And here in the main sanctuary, all I'd like to do today is pray for you. I'm not going to ask you to do anything. If this has applied to your heart, slip out, come to this altar. I'll be back in a few moments. We're going to sing a few songs and then I'd just like the privilege of praying with you today. God bless you. Let's stand together, please. Be encouraged today. The Lord gave this word just for you. We may not be the prettiest looking bunch of runners that ever ran the race of faith, but we are going to get over the finish line. We're going to do it together and we're not doing it alone. Others are going to come with us. We thank God for that with all our hearts. Would you just lift your hands up, please, just for a moment to the Lord. Father, I thank you, God, for the blessing of truth. You said you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. So we thank you for setting us free from the lying power of the enemy, setting us free from the voices of condemning mankind and setting us free from even the fears of our own hearts. God, we lift our hands to you as a faithful creator who will never fail us and cannot forsake us. You've bound the integrity of your name in with the keeping of our souls. Truly, Lord, when we do come into despair, you are our glory and the lifter of our heads. That's who you are. Father, we thank you for lifting our heads today and putting promise back into our hearts, giving us the courage to go forward into what looks to be impossible. But when you've opened the door, nobody can close it. And so God, thank you for opening the door of hope again to, for our homes and our families, for our, the testimony of our lives, for the workplace, God, wherever and whatever, for the dream that you once planted within each of us. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, that you can take us in our weakness and do much more through us than you ever could have in our strength. Thank you, Lord God, that sometimes, just sometimes, you wait until there's nobody left but you. Lord, to do the greatest work, God, that can be done. The wine ran out at the end of the wedding and you produced another wine that was so much better than the first one. We thank you, God, that Lazarus had a first life and it was wonderful, but his second life was better. We bless you, God, 
that you don't come to us because we're strong. You come to us in our weakness. Jesus, Son of God, we give you praise for being so kind and faithful to us. I pray, Lord, the fact that we are more than conquerors, let it be a reality now. As we leave this church, may we not leave our hope behind. God, may we take this with us all throughout the day today and tomorrow and the day after, the hope that only God can give. Let that be what animates us and gladdens our hearts. Father, we thank you for this, God, with all of our hearts. We praise you and bless you for the victory. In Jesus' mighty name, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Bless the Lord. Don't lose your victory. We have in Christ a take out victory. You don't have to leave it here. You can take it home with you. It's a take home victory. And you can take it home. You can share it with your friends. But don't draw back from what God's doing in your heart and in your life. Thank God for you. We meet again 3 o'clock this afternoon. 6 o'clock this evening is going to be a wonderful day in the house of the Lord. Till then, take a moment to greet one another, encourage somebody, and we'll see you again today at 3 o'clock. God bless you.